Good evening, everybody, and uh, on this International Women's Day, a especially warm welcome to what is the sixth in the series of SNP leadership hustings. My name is Jean Freeman, and I'm going to be chairing tonight's hustings, uh, and I hope we can get as many questions in later on as we possibly can. I'll come back to that and I'll say a little bit more about questions in a minute. So like all the previous hustings, we are going to have a discussion and an exchange of views and questions from you in an atmosphere that is, uh, as we would expect in the SNP, courteous, respectful, perhaps challenging at times, nothing wrong with that, but remembering that we are part of one party and one family and we want to be able to be as informative as possible so that all of us can reach the right decision, the best decision that we feel we can make in choosing who our next leader will be. Uh, along with all of us here in Johnston tonight, of course the event is being live streamed, uh, so a warm welcome to everyone who is joining us online. The hustings, as you know, are really important and I'm really grateful to all of you for taking the time to come here tonight. It's not, we're not snowing yet, we're not snowed yet, but it is uh, cold out there uh, and a bit schnell to say the least of it. Uh, one more thing before I start the proceedings properly and that is to remind you that if you are taking photographs tonight, can you please take photographs only of the candidates? Um, and then uh, you will, I'm sure, keep those as momentums or use them on social media, however you want to do that. As always, in the hustings, candidates have drawn lots before we came onto the stage in terms of the order in which each of them will make their first six-minute statement. Once that's completed, then we'll come to questions. So uh, tonight, the first speaker uh, with us is Hamza. So, Hamza, you have six minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, friends, for being here. Really looking forward to an engaging uh, debate. Um, that Colin Mackay is not in the crowd, is he? No, no, that's all right. <laughs> Listen, folks, I wanted to start with a promise. I thought it was really important I did that uh, today. I'm going to make you a promise that we will, of course, always answer your questions honestly. But I'm going to make you a promise that I'm also going to be relentlessly positive. I'm going to bring forward what I can do, what my vision is for independence, how I hope I can be the best leader for the SNP. Because let's be honest, any mudslinging, any personal attacks, they only benefit our opponents. They don't benefit anybody else. So let's me, let me... Let me make you a promise, an absolute pledge, and you hold me to account for that pledge, that I will not be saying anything negative about any other candidate. They're friends of mine, colleagues of mine, and I'm proud to be in this race uh, with them. Let me also say that I'm a son of this party. That's how I view myself. I joined about 20 years ago. My dad joined, he tells me, in 1974, as the first ever Asian member in Glasgow. Nobody's ever verified that right enough, but I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure it is true. Um, and I joined about 20 years ago. I, I feel like I'm part of this family, dysfunctional family at times, but a family uh, nonetheless. And we owe the success of this party to each and every single one of you. The activists, the members, you're the ones who knock your pan in day in and day out on those cold nights, on those nights where there's hail, where there's sleet, and those soggy leaflets you're trying to post through the letterbox, that is down to your graft. And you're rightly proud of the record of your SNP government. It's not a mediocre record. It's a record we should be proud of. You should be proud of the fact that we have abolished tuition fees. You should be proud of the fact that we have the game-changing Scottish child payment. You should be proud of the baby box. You should be proud of free personal and nursing care. You should be proud of the fact that at every single turn, we have put the most vulnerable and the poorest first. You should be proud of the legacy of Nicola Sturgeon, because she has done an incredible job for our movement, for our party, and for our country. So on my behalf, the question I have to ask you, in fact, the question you have to ask yourself, is who in this contest 
is sounding like a first minister? Who is acting like a first minister or a leader? Who is rising above it? Who is making sure that they don't cast dispersions on others? Who is it that's being relentlessly positive about their campaign? I'm hoping that I can show you throughout the course of this campaign, not just today, but throughout the course of this campaign, that I can be the leader that you want our party to be. And why do I think I would be a good leader? I think because I have the vision. I want to inspire people. I don't want, to, I want, don't want people voting for independence just because of Westminster's feelings. I want to inspire them to vote for independence. My vision for independent Scotland is not to reduce poverty, it's to eradicate poverty. It's to make sure that every single child, like my girls, has the best possible start in life. I want independence because I want to build a well-being economy, one that puts people at its heart, that the economy works for the people, not the other way around. And that's how we get independence. There's no ruse, I'm afraid. The way we get independence is by making sure we have a consistent majority for independence, the settled will, just as we got our Scottish Parliament. We got that because the settled will was there. It obliterated the political obstacles in the way. And so we must do for independence. We're not starting at a zero base. We're starting at a position of strength. And it needs a leader who can govern well. I've got the experience. I've had some of the toughest jobs in government. You may have heard of the health secretary in the midst of a global pandemic. And of course, the health service has its challenges, but we have the fastest ever COVID booster rollout under my leadership. And not by chance, not by good fortune, that Scotland is the only nation that hasn't had NHS strikes. And that's because I've reached out to trade unions. I consider myself a trade unionist. Reached out to them, brought them close to us, ensured that we compromise where necessary. And that's the type of leadership I would hope to bring as first minister. So I believe I have the vision. I believe I have the experience in government. I believe I can inspire, bring people towards our movement. And that is the other question you have to ask yourself. Whoever the next leader of the SNP is, can they keep the support that we have, particularly amongst our young people? I'm so pleased to see so many of them in this room today who believe so passionately about independence. Our older members too, who can keep our support, but crucially, who can grow our support for independence? Not going backwards. We must go forwards. And under my leadership, I give you another promise that every single election we fight will be on the issue of independence. So I hope you can trust me with your vote, with your leadership. But let me give you an absolute promise. You're stuck with me. Whatever happens in this leadership, you're stuck. I told you I'm, I'm a son of this party. I love this party. I will always be a part of this party. But I hope you will trust me to be not just your first minister, your first activist, so I can lead from the front, so I can chap those doors with you, I can pound those pavements, I can look into the whites of the eyes of people and persuade them that with independence, we will unleash this country's potential and make a brighter and better future for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, and now Kate. Well, good evening, and I think there's at least some familiar faces from previous hustings as well. So there's obviously some serial hustings attendees in the room, um, but it's wonderful to be able to join you this evening. And the SNP is a party of, which is more like a family than a party. I, as some of you will know, have been off for the last six months. I say off, but the bags under my eyes suggest that I've not really been off. I've been uh, sleep deprived and changing nappies and I've got a wee six month old baby back home. And coming back into this contest was a bit of a shock to the system. But the first hustings last week that we joined, it felt like coming home. It felt like coming home to a party that is more like a family because together over decades for some of us and perhaps slightly less for some others of us. We've been in the bunker together. As Hamza said, we've been delivering leaflets out in all weathers. We've been there working together when nobody would listen, 
We've been there working together with the victories and we'll be there together, whatever happens. Back in the 70s, which is perhaps uh, a time that maybe more of you can remember uh, than I can, my family started some of the first uh, party branches uh, up in the Highlands, a bit further away uh, than here. Branches where very few people would turn up and the Scottish Parliament was still in the dim and distant future. But they persevered because they believed. They kept going because they believed. They didn't take no for an answer because they believed. And 30 years later or so, the Scottish Parliament was established. And I now look at the next generation and I wonder, what will it take to ensure that my little girl and Scotland's children grow up in a land that is free, it's sovereign, and it believes in itself? because that is our goal. And what keeps this family together is that unity behind one goal, the goal that whatever else matters, we can be free, we can be sovereign, and we can believe in ourselves. And as we approach this election contest, it's an opportunity for us to get behind that united vision. The SNP has always been successful when we were united, but uni unity is not uniformity. And in this election contest, I think it's an opportunity to get back to thinking about what steps are required to take us to independence. Because this election contest is about independence. It's about who's best equipped and who has the best plan to get us to independence. And independence is not an end in and of itself. Independence is, is about the end to poverty. It's about the end to injustice. It's about the end to inequality. And right now, as we're discussing and debating and considering, we need to create the space to think again about how to ensure that after excellent leadership at the top of the Scottish Government for the last 15 or 16 years, how do we ensure that we take Scotland into the next, not just 15, 16 years, but into the next decades, where in 100 years time, we're looking back, celebrating the fact that we are an independent country, participating fully in that international community of nations. For me, independence is about ending the fact that one in four children tonight will go to bed hungry and cold in a land that has a plentiful supply of food and a plentiful supply of energy. It's about ensuring that in a country with rich energy resources, our people are not in fuel poverty. It's about unlocking the potential of our green industries and ensuring that in Scotland, small businesses are creating well-paid, secure jobs. It's about reinvesting in our national health service and our public services. And it's about not needing to go cap in hand to Westminster for every last penny because we are rich enough to go it ourselves. That's what this debate is about. And ultimately, as I close, when I think back to my uncles, my farming uncles who started those branches in the 70s, with that belief in a future, we today still have that belief. It's that belief that holds us together. Uniformity is not unity. We are united whilst creating the space to debate and discuss. And the last thing I'll say before I stop is that we'll only get there together. We're a team. We're a family. And my friends and colleagues on this platform have great talents. Each one of our members bring talent and skill as party members. A broad base, 100,000 members that reflect the diversity of the Scottish people. And we'll only get to our goal by working together and ensuring that policy is built from the grassroots up and leaders take their steer from party members to ensure that branches are empowered to make decisions. So I will close by saying it's the belief that unites us, it's team that will get us there, and the stakes are high for the sake of your children, your grandchildren, and my children as well. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much, Ash. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us. 
uh, to be with you this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, around about this time, I'm normally asking people to think about how they felt on the morning of the 19th of uh, September in 2014. But I know there's some serial hustings watchers here, and you may have heard that story before. So I'm going to um, curtail it a little bit this evening. But the reason I tell that story is because I'm trying to connect in with that feeling that we had in that run-up to the independence vote. That feeling that we had, well, how I felt at the time, I had this feeling that anything was possible, you know? It was that feeling that anything was possible and that this incredible sense of hope and optimism in the type of Scotland that we could have. And I want us to be able to recapture that. I want us to head towards um, that vision of an independent Scotland. And the reason I want Scotland to be independent is because I think that many of the challenges that we're facing as a society can only be solved when we are a country that can govern its own affairs and we can make all the decisions about how we run things. And I want Scotland to be a better place for all of us to live in. But I feel that at the moment we are kind of treading water in that goal to be an independent country. And you'll know if you ever do any kind of swimming that if you're treading water for a really long time in deep water, that if you don't change direction, you can end up just being swept away because you tire out. And I feel we're a little bit in danger of missing that momentum, if you like, that take us forward. So I would like us to relight the fires of the Yes campaign right across this country and get back to that sense of confidence and optimism. I think we need to heal the rifts in our own party. I think we have had some divisions recently. And I think we also need to reach out and unite and inspire the wider independence movement because I believe that it's only as a group, you know, that, that really large group right across Scotland um, acting as one that we will be able to make that really strong case for Scottish independence. So I think we need to change direction. I don't think we can keep doing things the way we have been doing them for the last few years and I feel like I am the candidate for change in this. And I'm suggesting that in order to build up support for Scottish independence, that we restart the independence convention. I know this is an idea that's been floating around for some time. Give it some structure, um, build on it, get everyone in together. So over the last couple of days, I've been reaching out to other pro indie parties and to other parts of the wider movement. And I'll continue those calls over the next few days. And, you know, people are excited about the idea of us all getting together, putting our differences aside and working towards that goal. So I think that's an important part of it. And I'm also suggesting that we set up what I'm calling a, an independence commission. So for those that haven't heard that term before, this will be um, a body that will be tasked with setting up all of the infrastructure, doing all of the planning and the preparatory work that we will need in order to become an independent country. And it will be also be tasked with communicating the progress that we are making on that with the public and the media. And the idea behind that is that um, the people in Scotland will then be able to quite clearly see that we're ready, that we're ready to become an independent country. And I'm hoping that that will um, neutralize, if you like, some of the arguments against us being independent that we faced last time around in 2014. So as First Minister, I would see it as my role to focus on the priorities of the people of Scotland. So that's things like the NHS, the cost of living crisis, the environment, and jobs, high paying jobs for people. Um, I would put the absolute best talent that we have in the parliamentary group into those roles. And I would give them the freedom that they need in order to strike out on that, you know, in the way that they want to do and the responsibility that goes with that. And I'll be encouraging us all to be extremely transparent and accountable as well, because I think that's really important. And with that, we'll build trust. Good governance will build trust. And trust will help us lead the way towards self-determination. So I'm also suggesting that we take control of the process as well towards independence. And the idea behind that is that we just make this a permanent mechanism. And we give this back to the people of Scotland, where it belongs, and we let them decide when it's time for Scotland to become an independent country. So 
My view of leadership is that it's about getting the team focused. We all should be pointing in the same direction. It's about inspiring people. It's about building the absolute best team that we can so that we can get to where we need to go. And the idea of really good leadership is that you can eventually achieve things that no one even thought were possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the candidates um, that we've now heard from them. But now it's uh, time to hear from all of you. So it would be good. We've got just over an hour and a half for questions. So I'll try and get as many in as I possibly can. The candidates will help me do that with uh, as short answers as they can possibly manage. And you will help me with as short questions as you can possibly manage. Uh, each question will go to all candidates. So when you're thinking about your question, please remember that. Uh, each of them will answer uh, each question. Um, when you want to ask a question, if you could put your hand up uh, so I can see it clearly. I've now got the right glasses on, so I can see right to the back of the room, um, which is helpful. I can't actually read what I've written, but I can see to the back of the room, which is the important bit. Put your hand up if you um, can and are able to. Tell us what your name is and uh, which branch or constituency you're from. And please wait until the mic gets to you. With that all said, let's get going. And International Women's Day, I think it's entirely appropriate. I'm going to take the lady at the back there in the white jumper. Up to you. Just hold on for the mic. Um, all three of you have various approaches. Oh, sorry, I'm Denise Hooper and Bearsden Branch. Um, all three of you have different approaches to Section 35 and the GRE. Um, my view is that that has come about with the cross-party. And if you're going to do anything with it, regardless of what you want to do with it, Will you do it cross-party and not Scottish Government? So in my view, you're going to challenge it, challenge it, or review it, or negotiate. You have to do it as a cross-party and not just the Scottish Government. Because it, either outcome, if it's going to be trashed by the UK Government, then it's trashing the Scottish Parliament itself. Okay, thanks very much. Um, first to answer that is uh, Hamza. Thanks, uh, Denise, for such an important question. Um, look, I, I, I am unequivocal on this. I'm unapologetic about it. If you believe in independence, if you believe in Scotland's democracy, you must challenge the Section 35 veto without any equivocation. We must, because if we do not, if we cave in the first time Westminster use a veto, the first time they strike the red pen through legislation passed by a majority of the parliament, they will come after bill after bill after bill and they will undermine our democracy. We cannot let that happen. For me, it's very clear. I respect my two colleagues on the right for having a difference of opinion on the GRR bill perfectly understandable. The room here, half the room might agree with the GRR bill, half the room might disagree with the GRR bill. It isn't about the substance of the bill. It is about the principle. And the principle is that if we roll over and allow Westminster to use their Section 35 veto against us, what kind of precedent does that set? And I, there is cross-party support to challenge it. If you heard any of the comments from Scottish Labour, for example, uh, as well as our pro-independence colleagues uh, in, in government, the Greens, they were all uh, disgusted by the UK government's actions. So some people will say, well, you've got to look at legal advice, you've got to do this. You've got to... The first principle must be to challenge. If we do not protect Scotland's democracy, how on earth are people going to think we're going to protect their democracy and independence if we don't even do it under devolution? So I think we've absolutely got to 
uh, stand up against that Westminster veto. I think, as I say, if we don't, the UK government get an absolute free pass at it. And that's not about the substance of the bill, it's about the principle. So if I'm First Minister, I will absolutely challenge you. Kate. Thanks, Denise, for the question. And I love the principle at the heart of your question, because this is not about the SNP protecting its record. It's not even about the Parliament protecting legislation that's been passed. This bill was supported by representatives of all parties, representing, in turn, the people of Scotland. So, when it comes to the UK government attacking devolution, I absolutely take your point. We need to defend devolution on a cross-party basis because this is about the people of Scotland. Now, the challenge is that this is not the first time that the UK government has sought to erode devolution, nor will it be the last. If you want to see an example of them eroding devolution, we've got mandate after mandate for a democratic referendum that's been denied. So this is UK government will keep saying no and will keep trying to ensure that it turns pieces of legislation, whether it's this bill or the deposit return scheme, or something else next week and something else the month after, it turning that into a battleground. The only thing that will protect the powers of Scotland is independence. And my view when it comes to uh, uh, the, whether or not we challenge is that ultimately, if our focus is on independence, as one of the primary ways of delivering independence is good governance, in other words, meeting the needs of people in Scotland on a day-to-day -day basis. We do need to look at the legal advice, so we can't just dismiss legal advice. I think going to court should be a last option, not a first option. I don't think going to court is equated with standing up for devolution and standing up for, for Parliament. I think as an if we want to be independent, if we are going to be independent, we're going to need to fix our own affairs ourselves without asking permission or seeking a agreement with anyone else. And I think we can fix it on a cross-party basis, and I think we can do it in a way that reflects and respects uh, our trans community, as well as uh, respecting uh, women and girls and, and the big uh, debates that go on around that. I think we can do that because if we were independent, we'd have to do it ourselves. And I think we've got the capacity, the ability to resolve it ourselves as well. But that's not to say that I don't take into account the legal advice. And if we've got a chance of winning, I'll go to court. If the, uh, the advice is that we're unlikely to win, I think we should look at other ways to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Thank you. So the GRA, obviously, it's blocked right now. So that's the, the situation that we have right now. And I know that, you know, it's not going to be, you know, the choice that everyone would want. I probably, many people will know this, I didn't vote for that bill because I felt there was a, an unacknowledged conflict of rights contained within it. And I wanted to make very clear that with me, there'd be no uh, compromise on the rights of women and girls. So I couldn't support that piece of legislation. And obviously there was a fair bit of division in all the parties over this issue. Um, all the parties, I think, I mean, the, the Conservatives will tell you that they had a free vote. I don't think it was exactly a free vote, and there was divisions even within them. So most of the parties had a difference of opinion on this. So it is, it's a, you know, it was considered to be fairly controversial. Um, but we are where we are. So I won't be challenging the Section 35 on this one, because I'm very confident that we would lose that court case. So... Can I no, just, no, let me just can, finish no, one Just hold on, yeah, and let Ash finish, and then we've got others who want to take questions as well. So Ash, you So finish. my view on that is that the public won't forgive us if we spend hundreds of thousands of pounds of public money on something that they don't support. So I, I would, wouldn't want to do that. I don't think it's appropriate to do that. And, you know, if I'm going to go to court for something that the UK government are doing, and I'm sure if I was First Minister, there would be occasions where that would be the case, that I would want to do it on something where I felt that the public were behind me and they were supporting what I was doing. So what I'm suggesting is that this might be um, a very appropriate issue to go to a citizens' assembly. So we take it out of the parliament altogether, where obviously there, you know, we, could, we were, we, you know, the parliament obviously did come to a view, but it was highly contested. Like maybe that's the best way to express it. And the, the option that I'm presenting means that, you know, if we... You know, if Holmes goes to court and then he doesn't win or whatever, that's not going to necessarily resolve the issue. 
I think if we bring it back to Parliament, I'm not sure. I think it's quite divisive. I think we could end up just going around the houses again. So I'm wondering if the Citizens' Assembly is the more appropriate route for that because it would give the public a chance to engage with this issue and see if they can find a route forward. So I, I would say that what I'm proposing is a real solution and it's a workable solution in order to protect everyone's rights. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, next question. Yeah, the gentleman in the third row, you were quick off the block, sir. Yeah, you. Thank you. Tom Mathers, Press Suit Branch. Uh, would any of the candidates consider a more radical approach to getting an internationally recognised referendum? By that I mean, for example, a resolution to the UN, even as far as uh, a resolution at Holyrood about withdrawing from the Act of Union. Just something a little bit more radical. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, first to answer this time is Kate. Thanks. Well, Tom, I know that that question is born of extreme frustration, I imagine. If you're anything like me, it's extreme frustration at the fact that we have had countless mandates, we have the obvious evidence in front of us that Scotland is not being served by Westminster. And I suppose I'd answer it in two parts. The first is, before we get to process, irrespective of the process, I think we can't forget the importance of persuading more no voters to vote yes. Because ultimately, as I said in my opening remarks, I don't want to just get to the first day after a successful referendum. I want us in five years, 10 years, 15 years, to be looking back at Scotland's success. And I think the more people that support independence, the better. The more people that can contribute and work towards Scotland becoming independent, the better. I would far rather all of our fellow citizens were persuaded by independence because I think that is, a, that is the best way to proceed. But at the moment, we focus on a, a persuading a majority. So whilst we need to talk about process, and I'm going to answer your question, I think we can't forget the importance of trying to shift the dial further on independence by using each and every democratic opportunity to campaign for independence and setting out the persuasive economic case for why Scotland can be wealthier and fairer with the powers of independence. In terms of process, I think that's why it's important that members are empowered to have this discussion so that all routes to independence are properly discussed and considered because we obviously have become the referendum party, uh, thinking that the, the referendum is the right way to go about uh, securing independence. But I think it's really important that we have that wider discussion and debate. I personally still favour the referendum process because I think it's constitutionally and internationally recognised and watertight. And I think it is a, a, a way for us to campaign and to ensure that every each of our fellow citizens has a way of indicating what their preference is. But I do think we need to get back to having frank, open conversations amongst members for the route forward. Thanks very much. Ash? So, yes, is the answer to your question. Um, I think, I actually think I'm putting forward quite a radical approach, um, which is not obviously shared by my fellow candidates here. Um, and so I think that there's definitely a place, and I, I would, as First Minister, I think, go and see what um, further international support or recognition that we would be able to get to support us. Um, the approach that I'm setting out, I think, is also pragmatic. So I think it's radical, but I also think it's pragmatic, and it's born of, um, I'm also frustrated, and I think many people are, about the, the situation that we're finding ourselves in right now, where the UK government is seeking to shut down you know, Scotland's route to expressing its will, which obviously that is just not acceptable that the UK government is, um, is doing that right now. And what they want to do, obviously, is they want to stop Scotland expressing its will because they're scared of what that will might be, that it might be a vote for independence. So they're quite happy to, to keep that position. And what I'm saying is that, you know, in continually winning elections in order to seek a moral mandate to ask for a referendum, uh, I think that that is just doomed to failure. You know, we've been trying that for the last few years. And so what I'm saying is we need to move on from that now and try something else. So what I'm suggesting is that we 
Um, instead of asking for a moral mandate, we um, present them with a democratic mandate, and we give this back to the people of Scotland, and that we put in a permanent mechanism so that each and every election going forward is an opportunity for the people of Scotland to express their will. So if we get a majority of votes cast, uh, and that can be just the SNP, or it could be the SNP and any other pro-independence parties that want to sign up to that as well, then we will um, make it very clear in the manifesto what Scotland is voting for, so that the UK and the international community are completely clear about what's going on. And it won't be to request um, you know, a referendum, it will be clearly to ask that Edinburgh and Westminster get together and they discuss the arrangements for Scotland exiting. And I think that's the appropriate way forward now. And I think that that democratic mandate, that is, that is the route because the gold standard isn't actually the referendum. The gold standard is the ballot box. And this route gives Scotland the opportunity, it gives us the opportunity to use the only mechanism that we have in order to let Scotland express its democratic mandate and that I believe that that will be recognised by the UK and the international community because it's unacceptable and the UK cannot continue to keep Scotland hostage. Thanks very much. Um, Hamza? <clears throat> Tom, uh, like, like my uh, friends and colleagues on, on the right here, I absolutely understand your frustration. Um, you know, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, actually, regardless of whether you are, you know, we want our children, I want my children, not to remain in this unequal, involuntary union for a second longer than they had to. I don't know if you had, Tom, or anybody here, the misfortune or displeasure of watching PMQs today. I had to watch it because I was doing Politics Live. It was the most disgusting, dispiriting exchange. It was on the issue of the UK government with their small boats, uh, the new law that they're going to bring forward to turn away refugees. And then you had Keir Starmer, the paler Tory, the paler imitation of the Tories trying to beat his chest to say we'll be even harder on refugees. Now, why do I mention that? I mention that because the UN Refugee Agency came out yesterday to say that the UK government with their law are in breach of international law. And what was Rishi Sunak's response? We don't care. We don't care. We're not dealing with the UK government that's going to come up the road because they'll have a cup of tea and begin negotiations because international law tells them to do so. I wish we did. There are, they are a government who has no respect for international law whatsoever. So let's be radical. Let's be bold. If there is a route there by any means necessary that is legal, we should discuss that because that's why I want to bring forward regional assemblies. It's not a one-off special conference where you all have to go to Edinburgh or Glasgow. Actually, in your regions, let's have a real discussion about what options on the table. It will have to be within domestic law because they will never, ever respect international law. We've, seen, we've just seen that uh, yesterday. Uh, let me say that my belief is that our opponents are desperate, desperate for us to talk about process as opposed to policy. Because let's be honest, process might interest us, doesn't interest people out there, doesn't get them inspired for the vision of independence, doesn't get the juices flowing when we talk about independence, when you're talking about section 30 or de facto. People get inspired by a vision. They get inspired by what we can tell them independence can do, what it can unleash. That vision is what we've got to do. We've got to create that sustained majority. I keep going back to the creation of the Scottish Parliament. All the political obstacles that were put in front of getting that Scottish Parliament were swept aside because of the settled will. What is it Canon Kenyon Wright said? We say no, we are the state. We say yes, we are the people. It must be embodying that spirit. If we do that, then I promise you, independence will come. And that is what I aim to do. As leader, as first minister, to stand alongside you by any means necessary, within a legal framework that we decide collectively, we take your collective mandate, to stand alongside you and make sure we get our independence. But be aware, Tom, beware in fact, Tom, I would say, of anybody trying to sell you a shortcut because there ain't one. If there was, us three wouldn't be sitting on this stage debating with you. The First Minister 
Nicola Sturgeon be leading us to independence. So we've got to grow that popular support. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. There's a gentleman there with a green top on. Yourself, sir? Yep. No, sorry, it wasn't you. It was the fellow in front of you. You're both in green. It's a light green, and I'll get to the other lovely shade of green in a wee while. Thank you. Uh, my name's Aaron Maxwell-Cox. I'm Glasgow Cathcart Branch. We're quite rightly going to hear quite a lot tonight about independence and the route there. But from the day you're elected as First Minister, you're going to have to lead a government that has to deliver for the people of Scotland right now. So my question really is, on the domestic agenda, what is your priorities for your government uh, to improve the people of Scotland's lives now? Thanks very much. And uh, for us to answer this one is Ash. Yes, I agree with you because I think that, you know, there's a perception, I think at least, that the government is, you know, not focusing on the priorities of the people of Scotland. So I think that's very important that we make sure that we are focusing on the priorities of the people of Scotland. So at the moment, that is things like the NHS, um, the cost of living crisis, you know, those, those things are up there. I think the environment um, and the economy would be the top things there. So in terms of the NHS, I think we've got ourselves into a situation where, um, I mean, I've had a couple of conversations with um, staff who are working in the, in the NHS right now, and they've, you know, very carefully sort of taken me through the, the way that things are working right now. And... Some of them have, have explained to me that they feel like they are, you know, just absolutely on their last legs in terms of how things are operating. So what I'm suggesting for that is that in each workplace, the staff there can nominate um, both clinical and support staff to come and come to a summit. So I'm going to do an NHS summit because I think we have to do everything we can to make sure that we can support the staff in our NHS because if we're going to turn things around, um, we've got to support the staff, and I think it's going to be a staff-led change that will do that. So I want to hear, that would be something that I would do in my first few days, I want to hear directly from the people in the NHS about how we turn that around. And I also think that we've definitely got capacity issues there. I think we need to look at that, and I think we should be looking at giving care to people um, closer to where their communities are, rather than using the acute hospitals all the time. So I think that's... there's. Um, but I'll set out an NH pla NHS plan in the next week or so so people can have a look a lot more about the detail. But in terms of, of cost of living, I think there's more that we can do there. I've got a plan for housing as well because I think many people, much of their income is spent on housing. So if we can create a system where we have enough housing and where people's rents are as low as possible, that gives people the disposable income so that they're able to spend on other things. But I think in terms of um, you know, energy costs, which is obviously something that's very key at the moment. But we have to be clear with people as well. There's a limit to what we can do under devolution. And I think we do have to be straight with people about that. Clearly, this government has done amazing things in terms of mitigating, you know, spending millions of pounds mitigating against the worst of Tory policy. But we do have to be upfront with people. And I think that's how equally we make the case for independence as well, to say we can do so much under devolution and we'll protect you as, as much as we possibly can. But then look what we could do more if we're independent. You know, so if we're thinking about things like net zero, you know, we could be doing amazing things in terms of lowering carbon, but it's very difficult to do that when we're shackled to the UK. So that's, um, so if, I hope that helps answer your question. Thanks. Thanks very much, Hamza. So um, let's never forget that every issue comes back to independence because uh, again, every single time we look to go further we're doing so at least with one hand tied behind our back, often blindfolded, because we don't have those full fiscal uh, powers. If I take our budget, we know that at the peak of inflation, our budget was worth £1.7 billion pounds less. 1.7. Think what we could have done with £1.7 billion pounds more uh, in our budget. But you're absolutely right. There's four significant priorities, I think, that uh, the next First Minister has to deal with. First and foremost, the cost of living crisis. People in energy-rich Scotland are fuel poor. What a disgrace. What a disgrace. And coming from a UK government that, of course, controls uh, the energy uh, market. So let's never take, let them off. Let's make sure we are making the point that wholesale gas prices have reduced by 75%, yet bills are due to go up in April. Disgrace. And Stephen Flynn's been brilliant, actually. And Mary Black uh, as well, brilliant, putting the UK government, holding them to account 
uh, on energy bills. But what can we do? I want to make sure we increase the fuel and security fund. It's helped many, many families uh, right across Scotland. Affordable housing, I think, is key as well. I've made a, put forward a policy announcement that whereby uh, we'll be able to buy back um, those empty homes uh, and also for holiday homes, and this is largely in rural areas, but it'll affect many other areas too, uh, that we can bring them back into the social rented sector. Uh, sorry, for, 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 for second homes and holiday homes, increase council tax on them so we can reinvest into affordable uh, housing. So cost of living crisis, number one. Uh, help our economy. Uh, we, I was in a small business uh, today, and a, very, uh, a great uh, business in, in, in Irvine, great cafe, uh, Grow Cafe, and they were telling me that uh, they are struggling because of high inflation, high energy costs. So uh, what I would want to do is appoint uh, a Minister for Small Business uh, and Innovation and make sure that he or she works right across government to see what we can do to support uh, small uh, business. I think there's a lot we could do and I can get into uh, the detail uh, of that, but ultimately our small businesses in particular are our core uh, to our economy. And I want to build, as I've said, a well-being economy that puts fairness and fair work right at the heart of our economy. So that's two. The third thing is our public services. Again, I can't go into all the detail of it, but our NHS education and making sure we are doing everything we possibly can to help them as time of need. And the NHS, for me, as you would be surprised, as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, the route to our recovery for our NHS is through social care. We've got to make sure we continue to invest in social care. We do that. We stop people going in the front door of the hospital and we get them back out the, 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 the back door of the hospital as quickly as we can. I can say a lot more, but I know we've got to be brief. The fourth point is climate change. It is the biggest global threat we face. And in Scotland, we are leading the world, absolutely leading the world. And remember, the world descended upon Glasgow not too long ago, and we recommitted ourselves. So for me, I want to make sure if I'm First Minister, not just the people of Scotland, the world is left in no doubt that we take our obligation to the planet seriously. And I want to make sure we make pace with a just transition to a greener Scotland. Thanks very much, Kate. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Well, for me, everything comes back to one mission, and that is the mission to eradicate poverty. When it comes to health, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to our economy, my defining mission is to try and do everything within my power to end poverty. My sister is a primary one teacher and she tells me, she works on the other side of the country, that before you start teaching these wee four and five year olds anything, you have to fill their tummies because they're so hungry. And in Scotland, I think we need to face up to the realities that, as I said in my opening remarks, one in four children are going to bed hungry and cold every night. That in Scotland, the age difference when it comes to life expectancy between the most deprived areas and the least deprived areas is 24 years. That is an absolute outrage. And for me, independence is a means to an end. It's to give us the powers and the levers to end that scourge once and for all, because it's a disgrace that in Scotland, with the wealth that we have, the resources that we have, we have children in poverty. I believe if there was one strap line for what I want to see Scotland become, it is that equality of opportunity should be the birthright of every child, irrespective of where you're born or where you live. And so the aim with everything I do is to try and eradicate poverty. So let's take the economy. Growing our economy is a means to an end. Support our small businesses. They create well-paid, secure jobs that help families with the route out of poverty. They create the funding that we can reinvest in our public services so that we can reach those people where they're at rather than expecting them to come to us. So, if there's one task I'll have on day one, it is to do everything within our power, with all the funding we have, with all the levers at our disposal, to end poverty and to fight for more powers and more funding to end it once and for all, so that Scotland will not be known for the fact that there's 24 years in life expectancy between the most deprived and the least deprived it will be known as a country where it can be said in all truth that equality of opportunity truly is 
the birthright of every child born in Scotland. Thanks very much. Um, our next question, I'm going to come to you, sir, in that lovely colour of green jumper. I'm not going to comment on everybody's clothing, by the way. Uh, Simon Shilton, uh, Rutherglen branch. Picking up on what Humza said there about Rishi Sunak's comment, we don't care. I actually think we shouldn't care in the sense that this kind of gradualist approach, looking for legal affirmation, legal permission, in a sense it's playing into the British state's hands. Yeah. And it's a bit like that treading water phenomenon that uh, Ash mentioned. Really, is that where we're at as a nation? Should we not be taking the bull by the horns and pushing forward? Because it's strong leadership that takes the people with them. It's not gradualism in this kind of, kind of pseudo-legal uh, kind of acquiescent attitude that the people will somehow in X amount of time respond and therefore lead us to independence. Actually, the people will respond to strong leadership over a shorter time frame because we have the momentum, and if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. So all this stuff about you know, nuance, gender recognition, you know, the Supreme Court, it's all just froth. Strong leadership, taking the people with them, is what's required. We're an old, proud, ancient country with talent that the world is, I think, really envious of. So what are we doing with it? We don't need to ask anyone's permission. Okay, thanks very much. First to answer <laughs> your question, sir, is uh, Hamza. So let me again uh, say very uh, clearly that I agree that strong leadership is needed. And we've just had what I think is one of the strongest leaders, in fact, probably the strongest leader our movement and party has ever had. I don't think anybody can accuse Nicola Sturgeon of being anything other than strong. But the problem is, Simon, and this is where I'm afraid you and I will disagree, is that I don't think you can just declare your independence unilaterally. I think you need the legal recognition. If we do not have that legal recognition, no one will believe that we are independent. Nobody will recognise us. Look at our friends in Catalonia. Look at our friends in Catalonia. They're not independent. They've declared. They've had their ballot. But they've not got that international recognition. They've not got the domestic recognition. So I wish there were, I, I genuinely, Simon, I'm telling you now, and in fact, I'm certain it's the case for my colleagues here, we want independence now. Nobody's talking about gradualism. Nobody's talking about being slow. Let's just meander out. I could get independence yesterday. I would have got independence yesterday. I would have got it today. I would have got it tomorrow. But we have to build the popular support. That doesn't mean we don't do anything on process. I think we can think we can often think, well, you've got to do the processy bit first, and then you can get a date, and then when we get a date, we can begin campaigning. In fact, I've had people husting say to me, when we get a date, we'll go out and campaign. No, get out there, and we have to get out there and campaign now. We have to build the majority support. We have to build the consistent majority support. We do that, and all the political obstacles get out of the way. If you think, you know, I agree with you, of course we're a proud ancient nation. Of course we are. And we are actually the latest custodians of this journey towards our independence. Many people, decades, centuries, have been fighting for Scotland to be independent. We will deliver it. But there's not a ruse there. I'm sorry, Simon. If there was, I promise you, we would have found it. But strong leadership is important. It's not just leadership, though. It's building the right team uh, around us. And I want to harness all of the talent of all of the party. So I'm not saying beg Westminster, no. What I'm saying is grow that majority, as we did for the Scottish Parliament, and all the other political obstacles will be obliterated. Thank you. Um, Ash? Simon, you'll not be surprised to hear that I agree with you. I completely agree with you. Um, and I don't think we should be asking Westminster for permission because, in my opinion, the people of Scotland are sovereign. So we shouldn't be passive, and we should remember that everyone is always telling us, aren't they, that the UK is voluntary. So if it is voluntary, then Scotland must have an ability to express 
its will if it decides that it wants to run its own affairs. And I believe that it will express that will shortly. So I say that we take control of this process. And, you know, Hamza's obviously completely right. We do need to build that sustained level of support. But that's nothing new. We've known that for years. So we need to keep building that. What I'm suggesting is that with the Independence Convention, we can set the indie movement free. Um, I don't think that should be the job of the First Minister. I think that the, that campaign, that should be co-designed with the Yes campaign, the grassroots Yes campaign. Um, they can set that structure up however they want um, to design an effective campaign, which I believe will be won through conversations person to person, talking to people about the issues that are important to them. You know, make sure it's backed up by good facts and figures and good materials, but that's that part of it. And the other part of it is the, um, the Independence Commission. We need to build that confidence in the public. So there, there are lots of people out there, I think, that wanted to vote yes last time around, but they just had, you know, there was just some niggling doubts that they had about certain issues. And we probably know what those issues were. So if we take control of that and we start to build um, the infrastructure that's required in order to get people to have that level of confidence that Scotland is ready to become an independent country and that we have the infrastructure in place that we can do it and they can see that you know it's visceral that's something they can see and feel and they know it's there I believe that will give them the confidence to choose an independent Scotland so we should take control of the process obviously I've set out what I believe that should be and I'm calling it the voter empowerment mechanism. And it's just using the ballot box as the gold standard for the way of the Scottish people expressing their will, both um, to the UK and also to the international community. And I don't think there's a question of the UK government not coming to the table. I think they will. They may need you know, some encouragement. And we'll, obviously, we can cross that bridge when we get to it. But I don't think there's a serious question that they won't do that, because everybody respects democracy. You know, if that is expressed, they will. No, I think they will. So, OK, look at it this way. If yes had won in 2014, let's say, you know, we got 53% in the vote, and the UK had then refused to recognise that, you know, there'd be a laughing stock internationally. It's just not credible to do that. There would have been absolute outrage, and it'll be the same thing here. So, I think if you vote for me, not only do I have a plan to get us to independence, but I will also get us independence ready, which I think is the part that we were missing last time around. And I'm absolutely determined to lead Scotland to its rightful place, which is a member of the United Nations. Thanks, Ash. Uh, Kate? Simon, can I strongly agree with the point that you made about the importance of strong leadership? Because I think that at its heart, the route to independence is about strong leadership and I want to unpack that a little bit because first of all I think we need a leader that can reach out to no voters controversial though it may sound we all agree on independence I'd hope that all of us are going to vote yes next time but there's people out there that I am convinced can be persuaded and I agree with Ash that the people of Scotland are sovereign and that includes right now no voters who I think would be persuaded with the right leader who reaches out. This is not about a gradualist approach. I'm not saying that we're waiting decades whilst we build up the case. I'm saying that we reach out and we persuade no voters who can be persuaded. And my second point is I think they can be persuaded when they see that independence is not just an abstract constitutional term that's part of an argument. Independence is the route to eradicating poverty. And if you're outraged by the poverty figures, then you need to be able to support a different route, and that includes independence. It's about making it real for people, outlining the economic case for independence, outlining the ways that Scotland will be wealthier and fairer as a result of independence, making it real to people so that they can see it. And that's the second thing I think we need. I think we need to get serious about the economics of independence eh, and ensure that that's part of the, the debate. And the last thing when it comes to strong leadership is competence. Good governance is not just important right now in terms of meeting the day-to-day -day needs of people as, as the previous questioner asked. Good governance is political. You know, when we meet the day-to-day -day needs of our people, 
We inspire their trust and their confidence. And we need their trust and their confidence if we are to lead Scotland to better days. So I think this is about leadership. It's about recognising the sovereignty of the Scottish people, no voters and yes voters. It's about making independence real. And ultimately, it's about meeting the day-to-day -day needs so that we inspire confidence. And I am very optimistic that we're going to be independent sooner than we think. But it will come through that strong leadership. And I think the process, not quite, but almost takes care of itself as that support for independence grows with that approach. Okay, thank you. And next question, please. I'm going to come over here now. And there's a gentleman just there. Yeah, yourself, sir. And then I'll, after you, I'll come to the lady next to you. Yeah. You. Thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, Martin Carr from Barhead. Uh, my question is really kind of straightforward. We've got different approaches. We've got the, the Section 30 and we've got Ash's approach, which is to possibly uh, utilise the International Court. My question is this. We know that Westminster does not respect international law. We know they haven't given us a, a, a Section 30, even though we've countless mandates. How are you, as the leader of this party, going to smash down that door? How are you going to get across here? That's what I need to know. Thank you. Thank you. And first to answer this question is Kate. By building up support. And before you groan that that's a gradualist approach, I think we can. You know, I believe that Scotland will be independent because I think the facts and the evidence all point to the fact that Scotland would thrive as an independent country. We would be the wealthiest country that's ever become independent at the point of becoming independent. We have got far more inherent advantages than all the other small independent countries that are doing far better than we are right now just because they're independent. So to my mind, the facts, the truth, prove that Scotland would be a success as an independent country. And we can build up that support. We can persuade people. It's not a gradualist approach. It's about being on the front foot. Day one, if elected as leader, and First Minister, I would be starting the plans, the, the Independence Implementation Plan, which sketches out that within 10 years of independence, not 10 years until independence, but the first 10 years of being independent, how we would already be doing better than we are right now. And I think people are persuaded, not by abstract constitutional arguments, but by that truth. Persuade them, build up the support, and there's nothing that can stand in the way of democracy. You know, I would have thought that the dial would have shifted more than it has over the last few years. We've had Brexit. We've had Tory inflation. We've had challenges across the board. And yet the dial hasn't shifted as much as I would have liked it to. It's not shifted as substantially as I think it should have. I think it will shift and it can shift if we refresh the case, we reset the, the, the arguments, and we get out there on the front foot making the case and deploying all the facts and figures that we have at our fingertips that prove the point that Scotland can be wealthier as an independent nation. Thank you, Hamza. Martin, uh, first and foremost, the next leader of the SNP, we need to make sure that Westminster knows that that's a leader that's going to stand up to them. And that's why Denise's question about the Section 35 is actually really important. It's not, it's not actually really about GRR. It's about making sure that we send a signal to Westminster that they will not have a leader that will just roll over and cave in. Because if they know that, then the game's a bogey. Right? So we need to make sure that we are uh, absolutely, uh, we have a leader that will challenge Westminster time and time and time again. The second thing I would say is that the process, let's think about the Scottish Parliament. People may well have been end endlessly debating the process. What they were doing was making sure that the case for a Scottish Parliament was being put to the people. Now, some of that was to do with Westminster's feelings, but it was also about trying to inspire people with the vision. And then, of course, the process took care of itself. Now, we're not starting from a low base. We're not starting from where the, where the discussions about the Scottish Parliament began. We're starting at where we already have strong support. So we absolutely have to build that case, not get obsessed by process. Process, of course, is important. But if we get obsessed by process, we're not going to inspire people. We need to inspire people. You need a leader of the SNP that leads from the front, 
that inspires people about the vision. What we can do with independence, eradicating poverty, the well-being economy, how we make sure we tap into people's everyday lives and tell them it can be better with independence. And the final thing I'll say to you is you're right. They will try, the democracy deniers in Westminster, they'll continue to try to deny a First Minister. But if you have the majority, consistent majority for independence, they can deny a single leader. They cannot deny the majority will of the Scottish people. If they do that, they will be obliterated electorally, obliterated politically, obliterated in this country. And that's why, with a majority, support for independence, those obstacles will disappear. We can't sit here just talking about process. I know it's important to you as members. Of course, it's important to me too. But we have to get out. There's a civic-led movement and inspire people for the reasons why we need independence. If we do that, it becomes politically inevitable. Thank you. And Ash. So I take a different approach than my two colleagues here. I think that building up the support by itself, I mean, clearly that's important. I think we can all see that. There's nothing radical about that. But it won't by itself lead us to um, independence or to getting a Section 30 order so we can have a referendum. Because if that was the case, then that would have worked you know, over the last few years. I think during um, the COVID, you know, when we had the pandemic, the polls were showing a majority support for independence at that point. I think it, it got up well over the 50%. And at no point did um, Westminster look at those polls and go, oh my goodness, you know, Scotland's polling for independence. We must give them a Section 30 order. They didn't say that because you need to have a democratic way of expressing that. So building up support by itself is not enough. It's not enough of a plan. Um, you know, there is international law here. So we have the UN Charter. So it's Article 1.2, and that is the right to self-determination. And so I do not accept that the UK has a veto on the Scottish people, and we shouldn't accept it either. So we build support, then we demonstrate it in a democratic way, in the way that I'm suggesting, at the ballot box. And we know that many, many, many countries have left the UK, the British Empire, over the last years. And in each and every single case at the beginning, the UK said no, and then eventually, due to pressure, they later said yes. So there is precedent there, the precedent exists, and I believe we will prevail. Thank, thanks very much. Um, okay, next question, yeah, the lady just there, second row. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline Cameron, Johnston and Eldersley Branch. Um, I wanted to ask the panel about their future plans for local government um, and whether they would take a different approach to the relationship with local government. I'm thinking in terms of budget settlements, flexibility of funding and um, autonomy for local authorities to provide local solutions. So ultimately, what is the panel's vision, or the candidate's sorry, vision um, for uh, local government in an independent Scotland? Thanks very much. Um, first to answer this is Ash. Yes, I think we need to do, uh, I think we do need to have a different approach to working with our council colleagues because after all, you know, many of the things that the councils do are the things that are really important to people. So there are things that they sort of interact with, the tangible things around them like the schools and the roads and that sort of thing. So we, I think there often can be a bit of a perception that we are, you know, that the Scottish Government is kind of doing things to councils rather than working with them. So I think we, I would like to see us going um, more in that direction. So there's a number of things that we could do. We could look at alternatives to council tax. I think that um, you know, is something we said we would do before. I think there's definitely a case for, again, re-looking at that. I know that ring fencing can be an issue um, for councils. Again, that's something I think should be reviewed to see if there's anywhere we can, we can move that. Um, I am suggesting as well that we bring our council leaders to political cabinet. You know, that way we can make sure that we are keeping this dialogue going, where we can speak to people, we can listen to concerns, and we can work more as a team. And I also think there are opportunities for new uh, sources of funding. So I, I have a few ideas of very local sources of funding that we might be able to generate, which we could then give to either local communities or to councils in order to fund things that are important to local people. Thanks very much. Kate? We've got some exceptional SNP councillors uh, in, in Scotland and my argument for independence is that ultimately powers are best deployed as close to the people as possible. 
because when people make decisions and are affected at the same time, those decisions are far more intelligent. So the approach that we take to local government, I think, needs to reflect the arguments that we regularly use when it comes to independence. And I think we need to completely reset the relationship with local government, decentralise power and empower our local government teams far more. And that includes when it comes to funding, removing as much ring fencing as possible so that they can make decisions. But I don't think power should just stop at a local government level. I think we should expect local government to be empowering the teams on the front line, to empower our carers, to empower those who are working on the roads, to empower those who are working in our education system. Because if they have the power and they know what works, they can deliver that service or make that change in a far more effective way than perhaps is happening right now where they feel their hands are tied because of bureaucracy. So I would have a vision for local government that reflects the fact that power should be as close to the people as possible and I don't think the Scottish Government should be tying local government's hands as much as perhaps we have done in the past. And I say that as Finance Secretary, knowing how challenging budgets are. And often the fact that budgets get all stuck in bureaucratic systems rather than actually going to the front line is part of the reason for the challenging funding settlements. Thanks very much, Hamza. So I, um First of all, uh, declaration of interest. My wife, who is in the crowd, is a councillor, so I must be very careful what I say here. Uh, no, no, I'm uh, very, very supportive of, of what's been said. The problem with going third in the question is they've already said all the good stuff, but let me just add to it uh, if I can. I, I believe in a new deal for local government. I was mentioning before that Nicola's leadership, um, when she announced her resignation, I was pretty gutted, I won't lie to you. Um, but interestingly, when she was making her resignation announcement, I don't know if you remember, she said something along the lines of, because she has been such a dominant political force, and maybe hasn't allowed other people to come to the fore. And I think in the SNP, we've got so much talent right across the party, including, of course, those hundreds of local government councillors. Uh, and again, that's not just a nod to my wife. I mean, literally all of the hundreds of local government councillors we've got, they're a huge asset for us on the coal face, at the front line, doing an incredible job in really difficult circumstances. So we've got to make sure they feel part of the team. I've spoken to a number of our councillors who don't, and we've got to be upfront about that. We've got to be honest. We've got to accept that we could have done, should have done it better in that regard. So we've got to make them feel absolutely part um, of uh, the team. So what I would say is, for me, uh, independence is absolutely about giving power into the hands of the people. So I wouldn't want to just review the funding and the funding mechanisms. I think we could loosen ring fencing, uh, for example. I wouldn't remove it all uh, together, I think it was suggested uh, earlier on, uh, because I think if we did that, then you can imagine what Labour and Conservative councils would do in terms of our national priorities around eradicating poverty. Um, so I think we can loosen it, for sure, and we absolutely should look uh, to do that. But I want to empower them further. Uh, why do we not empower our community councils to do a phenomenal job? I've got many in my uh, own constituency. Uh, those people working day in and day, in, uh, day out, um, you know, coming to meetings in the evenings and weekdays when they've got other things to, to go to. I think we should empower them, put the power uh, in their hands uh, too. So, look, long and short uh, is, for me, a new deal. Just make sure that we give as much power as we possibly can to local government colleagues, but make them feel a part of Team SNP. Thanks very much. Okay, our next question. Let's, let's go to the back of the room. There's a gentleman right in the middle there. Um, you just hold on for the mic. Hi, uh, Daniel Benson, Paisley Tannehill. I'm an atheist, and from my perspective, it seems like religion is having an effect on how some politicians, and not necessarily all three of you, but how some politicians are voting. I'm willing to bet when the census data comes out, Scotland's majority atheist. How can we be sure that you're going to represent that view? Religion, if it's not the majority viewpoint, it shouldn't be coming into politics. And maybe it is just the tabloids that are making that the case. Can you get rid of that fear for me? Okay, thanks very much. Humza, you're first on this. Such a good uh, question, uh, Daniel. And I think you get to the absolute nub of the issue. 
the absolute nub of it. So I'm proud to be a Muslim, uh, proud of my faith. I'm going to be fasting in Ramadan during the selection contest. That'll be fun, lots of fun. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, it's not about actually whether you're religious, non-religious, atheist, or agnostic. The question is, do you use your faith as the basis of your legislation? I don't. I don't. Proud as I am, being a Muslim, my job as a legislator, my job as First Minister, would be to legislate for all of society. And you have to look at what is in the best interests of all of society. That's important. Now, of course, there's issues of conscience. If I took the assisted dying legislation as one example, that would, undoubtedly, if I was First Minister, that would be a free vote, given that's an issue uh, of conscience, a very sensitive uh, issue uh, indeed. But ultimately, at its heart, and I think what has been really dispiriting for people, I mean, I've had, I mean, literally hundreds of people messaging me uh, to say that they are worried about their rights and they would leave the party if they thought their rights were under threat. What I want to be able to do as First Minister is for whoever you are, that you can look me in the eye and you will be absolutely sure that not only will your rights be tolerated or protected, but they will be advanced where they possibly can. Because I'm a minority myself. I've lived in this whole, my entire life in this country as a minority. My rights don't live in a vacuum. They're interconnected to everybody else's rights. And we have to have a first minister. You know, persuading no voters is absolutely important to our cause. We've got to keep the people we've got. We've got to absolutely keep the people we have got. So religion is not a barrier to the top job at all. But it's whether you use your faith as a basis to legislate. And I want to make it absolutely clear, and I'll end on this point, that if I'm first minister, I will be a first minister that not only serves all, that not only protects all, not only tolerates people, but celebrates the diversity of our great nation. Thank you. And uh, Kate. Thanks, Daniel, I think you're right. I think that the census will come out and say what you, you think it might. To my mind, Scotland is a, a liberal, secular nation. And over the last uh, three years, I think it is now, since uh, that fateful day in February 2020 when I had to deliver a, a budget somewhat unexpectedly, I have made financial de de decisions without any distinction of who is receiving them. And I think that is how a politician should serve the people of their nation, irrespective of who they are, where they come from, or what they believe. And I think if you can do that as finance secretary, you can do that as first minister. Because ultimately, it's about ensuring that I, as somebody of faith that's been well documented, and I think I've probably answered more questions on faith than any other candidate uh, normally does in the course of their career, can defend your rights to the hilt in the hope that you can then defend another minority group's rights. And it is about how we each defend one another's rights. So I've given a, a very solemn and honest pledge that I will uphold the legal rights and the legal protections for every single Scot in Scotland, whether they are male or female or trans or gay or straight, because it's exactly what I've done as finance secretary ensuring that we put fairness at the heart of our budgets. And we know that often it's money that makes the world go round, and it's money that underpins the services that we provide, the, the help that we offer. Uh, the funding settlement underpins those rights, and those funding decisions I have taken have been without prejudice and without distinction, and that's what I would expect from any finance secretary and any First Minister, no matter what personal uh, faith they might have, or if they are an atheist as well, with no faith. Thanks very much. <laughs> Ash? Yes, it's a good question. I'm not religious, but I think there has been a lot of focus on, on this in this contest. And um, I think we need to be able to respect the views of those that are because there are many people in Scotland who do hold religious views, although perhaps, as you're suggesting, they are, are certainly not in the majority um, any longer. Um, when I was a minister and I was making decisions, you know, whether it was on legislation or on policy, 
I always try to look at things through um, the lens of whether something, you know, an ethical, take an ethical look at something, um, protect everyone's rights. And I also always try to keep a view to, because I think there can be a bit of this in politics, there's often um, something you can do that will give you a quick hit politically now, but it might not be good for the country long term. And I always tried to focus on what was the right decision that was going to be right for the country in the longer term, because I think that's very important when you're making decisions. Um, so I would see my role as leader or first minister as protecting and advancing the rights of everyone, which is what I've always tried to do. But I do think that the leader of the party and the first minister needs to represent the values of the party, um, the things that we stand for. And I think they also need to be able to carry the country as well. Thanks very much. <clears throat> okay, uh, next I'm going to go, there's a gentleman there. You, have you asked a question before, sir? No, you haven't. I tell you, your twin is down the front. <laughs> um, Cameron Mocklin, the Drossen branch. I was just wondering, for the next 10 years in setting aside independence, I know it's quite hard to do, mm -hmm. but setting aside, what's the biggest opportunity for Scotland in the next 10 years? But then also, what's the biggest challenge that's facing Scotland in the next 10 years? Thanks very much. For us to answer this is Kate. Climate change and climate change is the answer to both questions. Because Scotland has enormous resources when it comes to transitioning to a green economy. You know, I see the green economy as powering all the funding decisions that we make and all the um, choices that we make when it comes to our public services. And we know that oil and gas in Scotland has been largely, in terms of the revenue, has been siphoned off by the UK government. We cannot let that happen with our renewables and with our green energy. You know, we are one of the few countries in the world that found oil got poorer. And that can't be the way that we manage our renewable uh, sector. So the, the number of jobs that could be created through renewables, the, the potential for small businesses. I was speaking to a business uh, a few months ago in the hydrogen, green hydrogen sector, and they had had their pick of locations around the world to set up. And they chose Scotland because of the buzz in terms of our, our renewables industry, our energy sector, because they've got access to talent, they've got access to infrastructure, they've got access to research and development. This is where it's happening. You know, we're going to be potentially the capital when it comes to renewables. So that is both the biggest challenge, because we know it's a huge challenge, and it's not going to be easy. We need a just transition, a transition that truly is just, that doesn't mean that, you know, oil and gas workers are thrown to the wind. We need a just transition. But my goodness, if we get it right, the potential's huge. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Ash? Yeah, I think our biggest opportunity, if we set independence aside and challenge, is energy and climate change. I think that the way that the UK government has set up the energy market is, you know, quite frankly, a disgrace. You know, this is a huge transfer of wealth that's going on right now from um, normal people up the chain to these companies and the people at the top of these companies. And you'll probably be aware this isn't happening in, in other European countries. You know, there are other European countries, Spain, France, whatever, set, you know, very small increases to their energy bills. So this is really unacceptable that people's bills are going up by hundreds of pounds a month. So we, we need to do something about that. And I think that the two things are linked here. And we do have uh, an enormous opportunity in renewables. We obviously we missed the boat last time around because as part of the UK, um, Scotland didn't get a sovereign wealth fund like Norway, who found oil at a similar, similar time that we did. And we don't have that huge pot of money sitting there that we can use then to invest in things or things that are important to the people of Scotland. So this time, we have to get this right. So last week, I went to um, see flow wave so that it's the biggest they were explaining it to me it's the biggest um tank um, it's part of edinburgh university and it's a testing site so they use this um, to test sea conditions so they're able to move um, the water around in the tank so that you can get exact whatever sea conditions you want whether it's kind of normal or the 50-year storm effects and so on and that's for wave and tidal and Scotland is leading the world on this um, at the moment. We've got incredible levels of innovation, and we have products right now that could go into production. 
we're quite good at getting seed funding so that you know, people can get a few thousand pounds and they can create their innovation, but we're struggling a bit with that money that they need in order to scale up, because at that point you need millions of pounds to invest. And if we can do that, and if we can square that circle, we've got an opportunity to um, create our own energy company in supply and generation, generate this cheap, clean energy, as we're already doing, but take it to the next level, but also to be leaders in wave technology, a bit like the way Denmark were made such an industry out of producing the wind turbines. Scotland has the opportunity to do that. Um, and we can then, that will be a lot of skilled jobs as well, as well as creating the energy. So the supply chain is all there, and we need to make sure we do a better job of um, developing this industry than what has happened to Scotland in the past. Thank you, Hamza. Uh, I promise you, Cameron, I wrote green economy before anybody started speaking. Uh, because, no, I do, I mean, it is the biggest opportunity. I'll come to the biggest threat in a second, but the biggest opportunity uh, is absolutely uh, putting independence aside. Um, but linked very much to independence is a green economy. Tens of thousands of jobs potentially in Scotland through the green economy, that just transition. Uh, I want to make uh, Aberdeen, Scotland actually, the net zero capital of the entire uh, world. And we've got that ambition. And that's actually why the DRS scheme is really important. It's kind of a fair bit of media, as you can imagine, in the contest uh, already. A DRS scheme, if you think about it, we are going to be the leaders in tackling climate change. If we can't even take the small steps, and there's about 40 deposit return schemes right across the world, 44, I think, uh, in fact, if we can't even take small steps to get litter off our streets and beaches, then people aren't really going to take us seriously. Now, I think there's pragmatic things we can do around the DRS scheme. I've mentioned already my own view that we should uh, give, uh, we should exclude uh, small producers, for example, because we know it's the big producers, it's the Coca-Colas of this world and so on. They're the ones that are causing the litter, the pollution, uh, on our streets uh, and our beaches. So my point on that is, is that we can't be afraid to take the really difficult decisions on climate change. So we've got to do that. The green economy, tens of thousands of jobs, but also I want to make sure that in the future, and I've announced this policy already, that if we are going to profit from renewables, let's not let that profit just stay in the pockets of shareholders. Let's take a 10% at least equity stake in that so the profit comes back to the people. I think that's really important in order to give confidence because it's our resource, it's our land, it's our wind, it's our sea. So we've got to make sure that we are getting the profit back. The biggest threat, I'll be honest, going back to uh, the answer that I gave earlier on, we are dealing with a Westminster government that is lurching further and further to the right. Today, I mean, I'm going to keep going on about it, but today's PMQs was a disgrace, and that's a pretty high bar, because a lot of them are fairly disgraceful. This was a disgrace. And whether we have a Tory or a pay limitation of a Tory in Keir Starmer, Labour are hard on Brexit. They are hard when it comes to austerity, harder when it comes to immigration, or certainly trying to be. And so the biggest threat we've got to Scotland, uh, to our progress, is a hard right government, a government lurching further and further to the right. I know you told us to disregard independence, but I'm telling you now, that's why we need our independence and we need it as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see, there's a young woman just there. Happy International Women's Day, and I wish you all well in the rest of your campaign. My name is Maya, I am a member of the Greif branch, and I work with YSI and SNP students. How are you going to work with the YSI going forward in your campaigns and as First Minister? As we know, the youth demographic for YES is very critical, and we want to increase that. And we have a high membership in the YSI. And we had 100 participants taking part in a questionnaire, which we put forward to all the candidates. And thank you for participating, Hamza. Kate and Ash, it'd be great if you could please participate. But I think that's it's in my the post. question. <laughs> oh. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. 
Uh, Ash, your first answer. Yeah, I apologise. We haven't managed to get back to you sooner. Um, I have, we have received it, but uh, as you can imagine, things are, are very crazy at the moment. But I'll make sure that we get back to you in the next couple of days, Maya. Um, yeah, I really think that the YSI has got an awful lot to offer the party and clearly has been doing some great work on many different issues. I think I would like to um, specifically task um, the, the young people in our movement with voter registration especially if we're going to be coming up to some elections in the future, because sometimes um, you know, younger people are not registered to vote, and there is some really good data on this, that if you can get um, younger people voting when they're young, they are almost inevitably going to continue that habit, because it becomes a habit, and they, just, they know what to do, they know what um, it's all about, and they want to take part in that. But people who don't register to vote and don't vote when they're young, it's much harder to get them back into that pattern of voting. And we want people to be able to express their democratic choices. So I would love it if, um, if the YSI were to, to join and, and really focus on that. And also, I think um, YSI must have many, many creative ideas about how we can create content that would reach out specifically to that younger demographic. Because um, much as I might have an idea about what um, maybe a 19 or 20 year old might want to look at, I probably don't, to be fair. Um, I've got uh, twin sons who are 19, and I think they're in quite a different world for me some of the time in, in terms of the way they like to consume content and the, the type of programs that they watch and so on. So I definitely think there's something there. And also, I think there's some work to be done inside the party in terms of um, transparency, in terms of democracy, um, in terms of modernization. So I've set out an SNP action plan, and this is specifically about how we modernize and change and update the things that we do inside the party. So I'd love it if people would go and have a look at that and tell me what they think about that. Thank you. Thanks very much. <coughs> Hamza? Thanks, Maya. It's my daughter's name. I'm starting to miss her now. Um, it's been a while. Um, first and foremost, uh, look, I was really pleased to be able to respond back uh, to YSI's uh, questions. Thanks so much for uh, sending them across. They were very thoughtful, and actually, it goes to the heart of your question. Because what we need to do is first and foremost make sure we do not lose the young people from our party. And I've had honestly hundreds and hundreds of messages from young people scared about the direction our party can go in and saying that they might leave. So we've got to make sure we don't because they are the future of our independence movement. They are the ones, I believe, who are going to work, uh, who are going to drive that independence forward. That's not to disregard the, the stalwarts uh, in the room because uh, it's important we're speaking to everybody. But I think it is the younger generation that's going to power that movement forward. And why? Why do they support us in their droves? Why do they support independence way higher than any demographic? It's because of our progressive agenda that has won us election after election after election. And we must not roll back on that progressive agenda. So I want you to have every single confidence that if I'm leader of the SNP, next First Minister of Scotland, I will plant my flag on that ground. I will continue and build upon the progressive agenda of the SNP that has seen us win, as I say, election after election and grow our popular support. The second thing we have to do is speak to your priorities, as I've mentioned in terms of uh, the progressive agenda, but come to you. I can't expect young people to come to us. And our HQ team, they do a great job in some of the digital work that they do. But as politicians, we might be on Twitter. It's a bit of an echo chamber, frankly, a bit of a cesspit at times. Um, we might be on Facebook. How many of us are on Instagram? I think all of us probably are. What about TikTok? What about Be Real? Why are we not on the platforms where young people are? And we've got to make sure we are. Because it's not just a, a bit of fun. Actually, that is where a lot of young people, my 13-year-old stepdaughter, Maya, uh, gets her information from. In fact, most of the time she sees the news when I'm in it, she sees it because she's been scrolling. So we've got to make sure, and we're not only speaking to the values, but we are going to where young people are. But I'll just reiterate the, the point, the substantive point I made. We are only going to keep our young people and our party and our movement if we continue that to build on that progressive agenda that has done us so well thus far. Thank you, Kate. Thanks very much. Maya, I'm sure it's in the post, the responses. So thanks very much for sending that. Um, I first got involved with the SNP through the YSI. So I first got involved uh, when I was a teenager through the YSI, uh, jumping on board buses and traveling across Scotland, campaigning in various different elections back when I was a teen and clearly had no life. But never mind. Um, it's YSI 
individuals, students who have done so much in terms of campaigning. So seeing the, the YSI folks that came up to Shetland, for example, a few years ago, uh, and we toured um, the various uh, Shetland Isles uh, campaigning, and uh, the commitment and the dedication is, is second to none. I have three unpaid advisors in my home in the form of teenagers who regularly tell me what I'm doing, whether that's right or wrong, and the issues that I should be uh, focusing on. Um, and they are the source of so many good ideas. And I think, to Hamza's point, I'd absolutely agree. We need to go to our young people and we need to listen. So if I believe in ensuring that policy development is built from grassroots up, that includes uh, the policy agenda that we have for our young people. Uh, so it starts with listening. I think the second thing is ensuring that we're actually meeting uh, young people's needs. So right now, it's a horrendous world when it comes to high costs, inability to find affordable homes, high costs of transport, uh, the fact that it's an absolute outrage that uh, young people under the age of 23 get paid less than those above. So when it comes to meeting needs, Something that I introduced as part of one of the budgets was, of course, a concessionary bus travel for under 22s. We had a commitment when it came to fairer council tax for uh, <coughs> young people as well. Building more affordable homes that are truly affordable so young people have a warm and affordable place uh, to, to live. So that's the approach, I think, as a party. It starts with listening, working together to build policy, working together to campaign, and then ensuring that as a government, we're meeting the day-to-day -day needs of all of our people, including young people who are, you know, I, I turned 18 at the beginning of the financial crash when austerity was just starting to bite. And I thought that was tough. It's a lot tougher now when it comes to the impact of inflation, cost of living, and so on. So as a government, we need to use all our resources to make sure that fair wages are being paid, transport costs are being reduced, and every young person has warm, affordable housing. Thank you. So we've probably got time for about two or three more questions. I think there's a, a person right at the very back row there towards the end of the row. Hi, um, thanks. I'm Erin. I'm the co-convener of Out for Independence. Sorry, Erin, um, my apologies. I couldn't actually see whether you were a man or a woman, so oh. <laughs> that's why you became a person, but oh, a very welcome one. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, hi, um, I'll start over. I'm Erin. I'm the co-convener of Out for Independence. Um, and as the LGBTQ wing of the SNP, it's our job to represent the party's queer members and to convince our community to support the SNP and independence. Um, it's presently a difficult time for our community. Hate crime against us is up, wait times to access the Sandy Ford's GIC are years long, and no new patients have been seen for months, and the Hive LGBT Centre has been subject to attacks and vandalism. Uh, without rehashing the arguments of the past two weeks, we want to ask each candidate what you will do not only to safeguard LGBTQ rights in this difficult time, but to advance and expand them. Why should Out for Independence members vote for you, and what will you do to convince the queer community to vote for independence? Thank you. Hamza? Thanks, Erin. And um, look, I'm really keen to engage with Out for Independence and uh, some of our other uh, affiliated groups uh, too. Look, all of us stood in a manifesto and got elected on a manifesto to continue that progressive agenda. I think we owe it to all the people of Scotland to see that uh, through. I was also, of course, the Justice Secretary that brought in two laws that I would think that affect our LGBTQ community. First and foremost, uh, the Turing Law, uh, where men who are uh, gay, who are convicted of historic crimes, uh, unjustly convicted of historic crimes simply for being gay, I made sure they were pardoned under that law. The second law I brought forward uh, was of course the hate crime bill which extended the protections for LGBTQ plus people uh, to, 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 to ensure that they were safe from not just uh, hate crime, not just incitement, but also stirring up uh, offences uh, as well. Um, for me, I am unequivocal in my, not just protection of those rights, but the advancement of those rights. And anybody, anybody here who thinks that rights cannot be rolled back, look what has happened in the United States. Roe versus Wade, when it comes to an attack on rights. We're living in a time 
when there's culture war after culture war, wedge issue after wedge issue being brought forward. If anybody thinks that somebody will not try to roll back on the rights of our minority communities, they are burying their heads in the sand. And I give you an absolute commitment. If, for example, somebody brings forward a bill to dismantle your rights and the rights of the members that you represent, I will stand against them. I won't allow your rights to be eroded. And there's a number of things I would do. Uh, one uh, that I'm very happy to make sure I commit to uh, is a ban on conversion practices. Um, they are disgraceful. Um, I have read some of the testimony uh, from our LGBTQ plus members around converted conversion practices. If nobody's read them, uh, I would encourage you to do so. It's horrendous. So you have my absolute full support uh, in making sure that all minority rights and the rights particularly of our communities, our LGBTQ plus community who feel under attack, I want them to be able to look me in the eye as first minister, as leader of the country, and believe that they are no more then they, they, are no, uh, they, are, they are not morally inferior to me as a straight uh, heterosexual individual. And I want to give them that absolute commitment. And so I'm committing to you to not just say that, not just to advance those rights, but to make sure we go further and conversion, branding conversion uh, practices uh, is an important step for me. Thanks very much, Ash. <laughs> Yeah, Erin, I'm a committed, lifelong progressive. Um, I wasn't in the parliament at the time, I think it was uh, 2014, but just to say that I, if I had have been there, I would have um, voted um, very happily for equal marriage. Um, I want everybody in Scotland to be able to live their best life. I want everyone to be able to be their authentic self and to live in dignity and safety as well. I think protecting everyone's rights is very important. And if I'm the leader, I will see it as my duty to protect, to uphold and adva advance the rights of all of us. Thanks very much, Ash. Kate? Thanks very much. Well, the mark of true progress, I think, is that Scotland is a place where all minorities, including the LGBT community, feel safe and secure. And the commitment I would make to Out for Indy is the same commitment that I just made to the YSI, which is that Policy starts with listening, with engaging, and ensuring that our members, you and other members of Out for Independence, can shape the policies. Because ultimately, the party that we are a part of sets the policies, and the leader and government enacts and delivers those policies. And that's the approach that we need to take. And in terms of, you asked about two ways of advancing those rights further. And the two ways that I think, out of a number of other ways that I'm sure we could discuss at another point, is tackling hate crime and banning conversion therapy. Hate crime figures are quite clearly uh, increasing. They are concerning. And I think that whilst we need to empower and resource the police to deal with that, it's also about looking at other ways to tackle hate crime because it can't only be uh, the police that tackle it, although they are on the front line when it comes to it. It's also about ensuring that in every environment, uh, hate crime is not tolerated and is uh, condemned and is tackled. Uh, the second thing is on conversion therapy, and I have given my unequivocal support to uh, plans to uh, ensure that we ban conversion therapy because it is abhorrent, it has no place in modern Scotland, uh, and it's certainly something that I'd be happy to work with yourself and other members of Out for Independence uh, and other members of uh, the SNP in Parliament to ensure that there is uh, an effective ban. Thanks very much. OK. Thank you. Um, there's a chap up at the back there with, um, I hope you don't mind my saying so, sir, with silver hair. Um, Thank you. <laughs> All the silver-haired gentlemen are now waving at me. <laughs> uh, Robert Addis, Grief Branch. Uh, all the candidates said before uh, the, the, the top priority or the, the biggest challenge in the next 10 years is going to be climate change. So I was just wondering what the candidates uh, 
commitment is to our coalition with the Greens in the Scottish uh, Parliament at the moment. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, first to answer this is Kate. Great. Well, I think that the coalition that's needed to tackle climate change needs to be as broad and as large as possible because the only way we'll tackle something as profoundly challenging as climate change is in order to ensure that right across society we're taking the, the actions that we need to. In terms of the coalition, specifically with the Greens, probably of all the candidates, I've got the most experience of having to do budget deals with the Greens prior to the, the, the coalition. So I know how, first of all, challenging it is to get budgets through Parliament, so I'm in no doubt as to the challenges of minority government. But secondly, I, I've been happy to work with the Greens in the past and would continue to be happy to work with the Greens. I have been clear, though, in this uh, election that I really think we need to get to grips with economic prosperity. So obviously, when it came to the, the Butte House Agreement, one of the areas that was excluded was uh, some of the work on the economy. So I think there would need to be a conversation. Uh, I'm willing to work with the Greens, and the question for them is, would they be willing to work with me when it came to putting that economic prosperity front and centre because I think it is the only way that we can eradicate poverty eh, through the creation of well-paid, secure jobs eh, and raising the funding to then reinvest in our public services. So for me that economic prosperity point is non-negotiable because I think it's so fundamental to our agenda as a government. Uh, but certainly that, that I would eh, put my hand out that hand of friendship to work with them and it would be up to them as to whether they could they could work with me. Thanks very much. Humza? Um, look, it's so, so important that whoever the next First Minister is, I hope it's me, but whoever the next First Minister is, that they are a unifier and unifying our movement. And if the first act of a first minister, a new first minister, is to reject and rip up the agreement with the only other pro-independence party in the Scottish Parliament, that's not unity. That's not gonna further our cause. That's not gonna help us win independence. And I've taken more bills through the Parliament than a lot of other uh, ministers of my ten and a half years in government and of course I know what it's like to work in minority government but I'll tell you now the political culture in this parliament is the most toxic I've ever seen it and if we do not have that pro-independence majority every single day will be a fight to get a legislative program all three of us agree that good governance is exceptionally important to win the cause of independence Good governance becomes 100 times more difficult if you're having to try to cut a deal with Douglas Ross or Anna Sauer. Way more difficult. As opposed to our friends who share many common principles with us, including independence, in the Greens. And the second point, which is, I think, incredibly important, is that I want to be the First Minister and the leader of our party that empowers and listens to our membership, listens to the democratic voice of the membership, over 95, no, about 95%, over 94% of the membership voted for the Green Deal. So if you truly believe in listening to our membership, you've got to make sure we continue with the Butte House Agreement. And on this principle of the economy and economic prosperity, Actually, the Greens believe in the well-being economy. They don't believe in growing the economy for the sake of growing the economy. They believe, like I do, in the well-being economy, the economy that works for the people, not the other way around. Where fairness, where health, where happiness is given equal weight, nay, more weight than economic growth. And so I end on the point that I started. Um, uh, I would say this, that our pro-independence majority in the parliament, if that is the first act is to rip that up, then we don't only become ungovernable, we become unelectable, and I won't do that. Thank you, and Ash? Yeah, it's a good question. I would want to, you know, we're, it's mature. We've got to be uh, mature about these things. They are our current coalition partners. 
So clearly the best way to go about this is to, you know, for whoever becomes leader to, to sit down and talk to them about if, if there's a possible route forward. Now, um, I haven't managed to, to speak to the Greens. I did um, try to call Patrick Harvey, I think it was yesterday, and he, to my knowledge, he hasn't returned my call as yet to have a chat with him about some of these issues. But I have seen some reports in the press where the Greens themselves has, have said that you know, if certain of us become First Minister, that they would consider that to be a red line for them. So obviously it's not just based on what we think, it's obviously based on what the Greens think themselves. Obviously we are aligned with them on some areas and some policies, but there are other areas where we're not aligned. And I think we need policy and law that works well for the people of Scotland. So for me, I'm not prepared to sign up to a, a coalition at any cost. You know, I'm, I think coalitions can be good and they can work, but not at any cost at all. So I'm not afraid of operating in a minority government if it comes to that, and I'd be up for that challenge. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, um, our next question. Now, depending on how quick the question is and how quick the answers are, this might be the last question. Um, so uh, let's see who wants to ask that question. Um, there's a gentleman just there with glasses on. Yeah, yourself. Yeah. No, sorry, sorry. There. No. Excuse me. Where? I don't know where you're going, but it's right down in the second row. There you go. Thank you. Um, so I'm Adrian and I'm from the Govan Kingston branch. Um, so my question is about the fact that the SNP is the party of independence and the first minister that we currently have has won eight elections. Mm -hmm. And I think I speak to something that Hamza mentioned earlier and I know I may not look at it with the, the grey hairs on my head, but I'm a young individual myself. And I do have my own concerns in terms of the direction of the party and it is at a, a juncture. So my question is, is that since 2014 and over the last eight general elections, the SNP has been a progressive party. It has been left of centre. Mm -hmm. So what are you candidates going to do to make sure that you don't abandon the, those that vote for us, that trust their vote with the SNP? But not only that, that you maintain the progress that's been made and go further than what has already happened. Because I am afraid, and part of my concern is, is that if we go off in a different direction, just as Hamza was saying, that it's not unifying the base that we've already got that's actually dismantling it. Thanks very much. And first to answer this is Ash. Thank you, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I would uh, describe myself as left of centre, which I think we're a left of centre party, and I think we're in a left of centre country as well. So I, I feel that my politics align very well with the party and with the country. And I think I would see that as the legacy. We've, you know, clearly we've had some really great policies that I know that the people of Scotland value very highly. So whether that's um, free um, tuition for our university students, free prescriptions, um, I know that the under 22s bus travel, you know, is, is really well regarded and I could go on, there's so many policies. So I would look to protect that legacy and to build on that. And I have some other ideas of my own that I think are things that we could be developing. So the energy company is, is one. Um, I've also set out a plan for housing. I think that you know, many young people are, are struggling to get onto the housing ladder because of the way that the costs to do with housing are really accelerating. So I've got some ideas about how we might um, uh, face that so that we can um, make sure that everyone has the ability to, to live in a safe, comfortable and affordable home. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kate. I think those successes, and I've, as probably other candidates here and probably many of you in this room, I've been a part of so many of those elections. The success that we've had as a party is because of exceptional leadership, not least in the form of, of Nicola Sturgeon most recently, exceptional leadership, and also a party that was able to speak to people in Scotland earn their trust and their confidence and then deliver for them. And that has been the recipe for success, as it were, at every election. People trusted us to know and understand the challenges that they faced and then trusted us to actually deliver. We have come through a, a really challenging few years. We've had the impact of Brexit. We've had the impact of COVID. 
We're now in the teeth of a cost of living crisis. <coughs> And we also need to be clear about what the next steps are to get to independence. And I don't think it's ever been more important than it is now to have this deep, serious, adult debate and discussion about where we go next as a party to ensure that we continue to speak for the people, earn their trust and deliver. Because the challenges over the next decade are going to be different to the challenges we've had in the last decade. The position when it comes to independence has slightly changed, you know, in terms of our relationship with the European Union, in terms of a, a UK government that's just absolutely, constantly eroding devolution. So these issues need to be grappled with as a party. And I think that's why we do need to take the opportunity to have a robust, frank conversation and not be scared of having uh, those debates. But Ultimately, the recipe for success is still the same. It has to be the same. It has to be standing up for ordinary people in Scotland, listening to them and earning their trust that we will deliver, that we will not back down, we will deliver. And I think over the next few, uh, next few, few days and, and weeks as this contest continues, the issues that we need to answer are this. How do we ensure that this time we deliver independence. We don't just defend devolution, although that's important. We actually deliver, deliver independence once and for all. And we can only do that by persuading more people to join our cause. The second thing is, how do we get serious, as we have been doing already, about ending once and for all the scourge of poverty? We have been doing a lot through the Scottish Child Payment, but we need to go further and faster. And I think that comes through a growing and prosperous economy. And so changing tack on those issues. So the recipe hasn't changed, but this is an opportunity for a frank and robust discussion and exchange of ideas about how we take it further. Not because we, the party, have changed, but because our wider environment has changed. And because the only way that we will secure independence is by persuading those who are not yet persuaded we can do that. We can always do that. We do that through teamwork and through persuasion. And I think we will get to independence as a result. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much. And Andrew? Adrian, you said you're from Government Kingston branch. Your MSP might have a bit more time to come to your uh, branch meetings. A certain Nicola Sturgeon uh, might well be attending, I imagine. Um, really good question. Really good question. So at its heart, is what I've already said in response to a number of questions. Why have we become the dominant political force in Scotland? We can't ever be complacent about that. How did we get there? Uh, how did we replace Labour, essentially, as that dominant force? We did so because we spoke to the values of the Scottish people. Our progressive agenda, that is what got us here. And that's why we have to be so careful that the next leader we pick of the SNP, you have to have confidence, Adrian, that they're going to build upon that legacy. Do things differently, absolutely. I'll be my own man, I'll have my own leadership style. But I commit to building upon that legacy. And that's why it's so important we don't trash a record. Our record in the Scottish Government has been an exceptional record. You've been having those doorstep conversations day in and day out over the last 15, almost 16 years that we've been in government. So it's so important that we don't undo all of that good work, but we build upon a strong foundation that Nicola Sturgeon and others have built in the last 15 years. So you know, my answer to you is really simple, and I can keep it short enough to say that we've got to make sure that as a party and as a movement, we continue to reflect the values of the majority of Scotland. We do that, we keep winning. We do that, we will gain our independence. Thank you very much. So there we are. We've got to nine o'clock. My apologies to those of you who still had questions and we didn't have time uh, to get to you. Um, can I ask you, though, to thank the candidates uh, together one last time, please?
we've got three more hustings in this uh, uh, leadership uh, election campaign. Uh, next one is in Lothian, then in Glasgow, then in Aberdeen. All will be uh, streamed online, so if you want to watch any of those, uh, then please uh, do so. Uh, for now, though, uh, my thanks to all of you for giving us uh, your time and your attention, both here in Johnson and online, and for the excellent questions that you were able to ask. So my thanks to you, and I think you deserve a round of applause too. That's us for tonight. Safe home. Thank you.